And um, I would encourage everyone also to use the, uh, where's this, sorry, trying to do two things at once. Um, to use the chat feature to ask questions um, or talk with the presenters since we will be pretty short on time. Um, and as a reminder to the presenters, I will be offering uh, 30 second reminders. Um, so we have five minutes for the session introductions and two minutes for each of the lightning talks. Uh, so it should be an exciting and, and fast paced meeting and thanks everyone for joining. Um, uh, Natalia will be our first speaker. Yeah, so I'll just say the first three presentations are session, four presentations are session overviews and then um, and then we're going to go into um, individual talks. So yeah, go ahead, Natalia. Hello, everyone. My name is Natalia Kramarova. I am from NASA Goddard. And today I will present a session, EGU session, a typical polar stratospheric winters in 2019 and 2020, causes and consequences. I am chairing this session with Arina Petropalovsky from Cyrus Boulder and with Diego Loyola from DLR, Germany. We will have our session, so we will have poster session and e-lighting session. Both of these sessions will be on Wednesday, December 16, and e-lighting session will be between 8.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We ask authors from our session to give us uh, teaser slides, and I will present you six slides today and it will give you a very good overview of topics that we will discuss in our session. Next slide, please. So this slide is provided by Zachary Lawrence from Cyrus Boulder, and he will talk about the remarkably strong Arctic stratospheric polar vortex of winter 2020, and its links to record-breaking Arctic oscillation and ozone loss. So if you want to know how Arctic oscillation is related to um, above average surface temperatures in 2020 and um, significant ozone losses, you need to see this session, uh, this talk. And his talk will be enlightening in talk at 8.36 Pacific Standard Time. So next slide, please. This slide is provided by Jezebel Corbella. She is from University of Catalina and she will have a poster and um, in this study, they looked at multi-level description of the Arctic polar vortex during April 2020. They focus on time period where the polar vortex split it into cyclonic vortices, and they used Lagrangian tools to, um, to see how um, air parcels split between the two vortices and try to find connections between, um, between them and uh, ozone fields. The next slide, please. The next slide is provided by Matthew Deland from SSI NASA Goddard. And this study um, is looked at polar stratospheric clouds variability during the Northern Hemispheric winter 2019-2020 with OMS limb profiler. And uh, limb profiler observations show unprecedented amount of polar stratospheric clouds, particularly in March 2020 which is directly linked to um, significant losses in Arctic low stratospheric ozone. Uh, and he will have a lighting presentation. The next slide, please. The next slide is presented by Mark Weber uh, from University of Bremen, and he will have a poster titled um, The Unusual Stratospheric Arctic Winter. In this study, Others look at, strat uh, at um, satellite measurements from Centennial 5 Trapomi instrument, and also at the analysis data and model simulations with Tomcat CTM model to quantify ozone losses in Arctic stratosphere. The next slide, please. The next slide is provided by Lawrence Coy and um, fro from NASA Goddard. In this study, they looked at forecasting of low column ozone in winter 2019-2020 in Northern Hemisphere with the NASA GEOS model. The GEOS CF, that stands for um, Composition Forecasts, uh, demonstrated very good pre prediction capability. 
particularly in March, it predicted a zone loss uh, in four, five day forecast in contrast to standard geos uh, forward processing systems that uh, predicted a zone increase over the same period of time because it tends to go back to climatological values. And the next slide, please. And this is another study presented by Simon Lee. And it also focuses on seasonal forecast of the exceptional Northern Hemisphere winter in 2020. In this study, others look at six different seasonal prediction systems. And they evaluated how well uh, this system forecast the strong stratospheric vortex and positive Antarctic Arctic oscillation, and also how unusual were the predictions compared to, to hincasts. And was there any link? Natalia, this is just, sorry, your 30 second warning. Thank you. Okay, between stratospheric and tropospheric prediction scale. So if you want to know answers on all these questions, you need to uh, look at this enlightening presentation. And we invite you to join our session, which will be on Wednesday, December 16. Thank you so much for your attention. Hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Minghui Diao. I'm from San Jose State University. We have two AGU sessions. One is oral, one is a poster. And our title is Microphysical and Macrophysical Properties and Processes of Ice and Mixed Phase Clouds. And we feature a variety of uh, technology to measure or simulate these clouds, including in situ observation, remote sensing observation, and multi scale models. So for the oral session, it is on Monday, December 7, and it is uh, Pacific Standard Time uh, in the afternoon from 4 to 5. We have eight talks. And the poster session is on Monday. Uh, it is actually a whole day long on, on December 7th. And you can actually talk chat online with the uh, speaker for poster presentation. We have 14 posters in total. So there are three other conveners for this session, Yugu from UCLA, Xiaohong Liu from Texas AMM, and James Campbell from NRL. Next slide, please. Uh, I only listed uh, the name of the talk because I, I think there are a lot of information, but you can use the link that I gave to you in the previous slide to check them out. So for the oral session, we have eight talks. And for this year's AGU, I want to mention that only an overview will be given during the oral session. That means that you would have to check out the 15 minute longer talk on your own time before the uh, session starts. So during the virtual session, each talk will be four minutes. And the first two talks are actually about Cirrus Cloud. So the third talk, which is given by Xiaohong Liu from uh, University, uh, actually now he's at Texas AMN, that is an Arctic talk. He, he will be talking about impacts of high latitude, local and long range transported dust on Arctic mixed with clouds through heterogeneous ice nucleation. In his abstract, he mentioned that he will be using the DOE E3SM model, which is a climate model, to compare the contribution from different uh, uh, regions for the um, dust emission, and then how much they will contribute to the mixed phase cloud formation in the Arctic. Another Arctic talk is given by uh, Alexei Korolev. And this is an invited talk. So he will give a summary of all the current understanding on mixed phase clouds. And in his talk, I believe he will also feature the Arctic clouds for both observation and simulation. And the next talk uh, that will be talking about Arctic clouds is uh, given by Bart Gears from University of Wyoming. He will uh, mention, he will focus on the microphysics and mesoscale dynamics of marine boundary layer clouds in cold air over open water. His abstract actually mentioned two uh, DOE campaign, Marcus, which is over Southern Ocean, and Combo, which is in the Arctic. So he will be talking about both field campaigns. Another one is given by Israel Silver from Penn State. Uh, his title is Prevalence of Precipitation from Polar Supercooled Clouds in Observations and Models. And he will also feature both Antarctic ground-based observations and Arctic ground-based observation. And he will be comparing with some of the NASA uh, climate model. Uh, so we will have four talks in total in the oral session. And next slide, please. 
for the 14 posters, this is all of them, and I highlighted the Arctic related posters, uh, starting with Rosa Gierens, and she's actually uh, from University of Helsinki, and she will be talking about investigating microphysical processes in Arctic mixed phase clouds using cloud radar Doppler spectra. So this will be using a suite of ground-based measurement to analyze the microphysical properties of Arctic clouds. The next one is given by Tyler Byron. Uh, he's actually a first year graduate student at San Jose State. So he will be using some of the ground-based observations to uh, analyze clouds in the high latitude. And another one given by August Mickelson from University of Washington. This one is using uh, both Raman LiDAR and space LiDAR to analyze mixed phase clouds uh, featuring the extinction profile. And the next slide, uh, sorry, uh, next talk, Paul McGlynn, that one is about impacts of ice particle shape effects on Arctic mixed phase cloud presence. And particularly, this is a unique talk because um, this will talk about how temperature will influence the ice shape and uh, how current simulation would overlook some of these uh, impact and probably influence the radiative effect. And for the uh, next and one- This is we... your 30 second warning, thank you. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. I'll just quickly go through. We have a few other talks such as a balloon holographic instrument also about Arctic clouds. And we have another talk um, for Florin Torin, that, that's a uh, LES simulation. And this is actually about a campaign called Activate. And she will uh, summarize what has been learned from the campaign. Meng Zhang will be talking about the uh, E3SM model, again, a DOE model, and how the low level mixed phase cloud is being represented in it. And the uh, Hui Ying Zhang will uh, show orographic effects on mountain Arctic mixed phase clouds. So uh, please feel free to check out these posters in advance because they should already be posted by the end of this Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Kai. So I'm just gonna give a quick introduction to our uh, session on UAS in atmospheric research. This is not an Arctic specific session, but there are quite a few um, Arctic centric presentations and you'll hear about a bunch of those in just a few minutes. So I'm not gonna provide too many details, but our session is uh, December 7th on Monday. And we have one oral session with eight talks from four to 5 p.m. Pacific time. And then a poster session on the same day, which goes the whole day. And as was mentioned earlier, you can chat with the um, poster presenters and just check out the posters when you have time. Um, so Fan May from PNNL is actually the primary convener, and I'm a co-convener along with Greg McFarquhar and Dan Schmidt. All right, next slide, please. So I just wanted to highlight a few specific presentations of interest, and these are um, connected to perhaps high latitude applications. Um, the first two are oral presentations, and you'll hear from Radiance in a second. Uh, the other one is uh, related to development of capabilities for operations, uh, both at high altitude and high latitude settings. Um, Radiance Calmer will be presenting on her efforts during Mosaic. Um, and then there are a bunch of posters, including posters that connect to Arctic aerosol properties using tethered balloon instrumentations, um, deploying systems at high latitudes, and a bunch of, again, instrumentation and kind of capability um, centric presentations uh, with respect to measuring aerosol properties, uh, radiative properties, et cetera. So that's my really quick introduction and I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thanks, Heis. Uh, Mindy, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hey, thanks for um, allowing us to try to advertise our session. It's on <clears throat> Extratropical superstorm classification impacts and trends. Now, this is going to isn't specifically for the Arctic, but it definitely will have implications for the Arctic. I'm the primary um, convener, but <clears throat> with Matthias Jacob from uh, local engineering company, Michael Dettinger um, 
uh, from Scripps, had been with USGS, and Dale Cox. Um, and Rupin's also going to be a, oh, can you go on to the next one? Rupin's going to be a co chair. And <clears throat> this is just an introduction to the session. Um, we have lots of issues with trying to identify how do we categorize storms. We'd like to classify them, but we're trying to compare them with what other people are saying. Let's go to the next. This is just an example. Um, the top one is uh, Mar Martin Ralph. He, Marty Ralph is going to be talking in our session, and he's and his team at uh, UCSD has developed a, and NOAA uh, an atmospheric river scale. <laughs> We've adapted that to try to include extratropical storms, and so we'll be talking about our work. And there's a number of people um, from around the world that'll be talking on aspects of this. I just showed an example, uh, the lower left is using the Japan reanalysis, classifying storms from one to five based on integrated vapor transport, as Marty had done. And Alex Cannon from our Victoria office has shown how many, how often we get storms of different categories. And then we ran it from 7,000 simulations um, for 150 years. And it, all of these keep showing that we're getting much stormier and we're on the cusp of it. So these are really important and these are punching their way into the Arctic. Can we have the next one? And this is a storm we have right on our doorstep that's coming tonight. We, Rita did this up for you guys. You can see how this, this storm with a long um, moisture stream is aiming up towards the Arctic and sometimes they actually punch all the way through and give freezing rain all the way as far as Tuk Tuk Tuk. So, but we're we're trying to do is rate them. We're trying to get a good discussion on how this should be done. And uh, let's go to the next. Sorry, I'm going through this fast, but um, and here are the, you probably can't read all of these, but come and join our session. And we have about eight uh, posters and it's an innovative new way of trying to share the information. It's on um, December 11th. And we have two invited speakers. Rupi Mo will be talking from our uh, Canadian um, Research and Development Office, and Marty Ralph also will be talking. But we have speakers from Pradeep from India and Lutien from Brazil. And um, we have our Forecast Center and uh, River Forecast Center. So come and join us and give us some good input and uh, I will include a, a picture for the Arctic for you. What would happen at Tuk 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 with our classification? Keep you curious, that's good. And we're now, thank you so much to all the session uh, conveners. We're now moving on to our lightning talk. So uh, first up, I believe we have Patrick Taylor. I'm here, awesome. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's afternoon for most, most of us anyway, but I'm happy to be here today to give you this quick two minute uh, teaser here for my AGU talk. I've been invited to give a talk that summarizes uh, current understanding and uncertainties in the processes that drive Arctic amplification. So obviously two minutes isn't quite enough to tell the whole story here, but you know, one of the big takeaway messages that I, I will hopefully make is that really to advance our understanding of Arctic amplification requires a much better understanding of how the sea ice, atmosphere, and ocean couple together, specifically in places where we're seeing some of the most rapid sea ice loss. So next slide, please. So in the remaining time, I'd just like to take a few minutes to hit a couple high points here. And first, I thought everybody would be interested to kind of see how the representation of Arctic amplification as a whole, which has changed between CMIP 5 and CMIP 6. Uh, and the plot on the left here is showing you CMIP 5, and each of these lines represents the uh, ampl amplification factor at each latitude band. And so the, the amplification factor is just the ratio of the total temperature, the warming divided by global temperature change. So any place that's above one here means that that latitude band has warmed more than the global mean has. And you see the most amplification, the most warming is happening in the Arctic. Now, if we compare the left panel to the right panel, you see that there's a slightly reduced spread here in the CMIP 6 results uh, in terms of the amplification factor, ranging from only roughly about 2 to just above 3.5. But in the end, if you look comparing these two, not a lot has changed. <laughs> Still a lot of uncertainty in the Arctic that we need to kind of grapple with and, and understand. So next slide. 
So again, since we can't go through a lot uh, of the different processes, one of the processes that we focused a lot on recently is understanding the lapse rate feedback. Um, that's the lapse rate feedback is one of the most, uh, what has been quantified as one of the most important for describing or for causing Arctic amplification. Um, and it, it comes and about this is because your thirty the, second warning. Sorry. Thank you. It comes about because of the sensitivity of the atmospheric fluxes, both going to space and to the surface, because of the, the sensitivity of that to the temperature profile. So what you're looking at here is the uh, upper left corner showing you the spatial distribution of the lapse rate feedback. And what we find is that it's much stronger in places that have uh, over over the sea ice and places that lose more sea ice. Um, and the bottom left corner here is showing you the different contributions to from the surface temperature changes versus just the atmospheric temperature changes. And so what we learned from this is that the lap rate feedback is strongest in fall and winter, and that it's primarily driven by the processes that are driving the surface temperature change, not the air temperature change. Last slide, please. And then uh, there's a hypothesis that the lap rate feedback is a stratification mediated feedback, whereby the lower tropospheric stability, a stronger stability means a stronger lap rate feedback. Well, in our paper, and then I'll discuss more in our AGU talk, um, we found that this, uh, we haven't found any evidence for this. In fact, we find that the lap rate feedback um, is really a, a feedback that's a seasonal regional phenomenon that's governed by multiple processes uh, and not just a single Patrick. process. I'm Thank gonna you. have to ask people to join your uh, poster <laughs> session. Thanks so much. I know it's a it's a short time frame, um, but I do want to make sure we have time for everyone. So, thank you and uh, Shima, you are available. Everyone, uh, my name is Shima Shams, and I'm a PhD candidate at Washington State University, working with Von Walton. Uh, my AG presentation covers a part of my PhD with the focus on ozone variation and analyzing the associated transport mechanism at higher latitudes over sudden stratospheric warming events. Next slide, please. So I think this uh, flowchart can be helpful to show different parts of the study and the full presentation. Uh, knowing, the high, knowing the possibility of higher uncertainties of models in high latitudes, we decided to conduct a comparison before diving into the investigation of ozone fluctuations. Uh, we use ozone sounds from four stations and solar FDIR from five index sites uh, to do the comparison. If you could next, we see a zone. And so, and because of seeing uh, a different, um, a strong influence of QBO over Greenland. Uh, all the analysis that I will say are applied on both zonal average and a, zenal, and a regional average. Um, so once we uh, once we finished the comparison, we, we, we looked into the composite analysis of temperature, ozone, potential vorticity, advection, and eddy terms. Next slide, please. So here I just focus on two of our plots to have a glimpse of the project. Uh, we're looking at the cross section of ozone anomalies 40 days before and 60 days after the sudden status reformings. And uh, we can see the increase of ozone right around the SSW incident and last for a long time, almost two months. Uh, you can see the magnified impact over Greenland sector uh, compared to the average. In the only parameter that I had time to show here is the average PV uh, during 40 days before the warming, which shows us the quick look at the difference of these events. Um, unfortunately, and this is your 30 second have, warning. Yeah, enough time to go through Oops, that. But yeah, you can, uh, I hope to have more discussion uh, with the actual talk. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Erin McLean with the Arctic Data Center, um, and I'm plugging my poster slash e-lightning section um, all about the Arctic Data Center. So next slide. Um, we are the Arctic Data Center. Next slide. <laughs> um, we help the research community pr reproducibly preserve and discover all of these NSF funded science in the Arctic. So whether you are a natural scientist, whether you're a social scientist, all of your data, metadata, software, documents and provenance uh, can go into the Arctic Data Center. That also means that if you don't have data to deposit yourself, there's also all of that data for you to take a look at. Next slide. 
Uh, we offer a number of features and services for researchers. Uh, we are a data archive first and foremost, um, but we're also that data discovery portal. We offer tools and infrastructure like um, an easy to use metadata editor, um, as well as support services like how to tidy your data for um, deposit into a repository. Um, I also do a lot of training and outreach. It's my whole job. Um, and we also do data rescue operations. Next slide. Um, currently, this is our state of the repository. We have over 6,000 data sets comprising over 700,000 data files. Um, and so all of this data is at your fingertips as researchers, um, as well as folks who are interested in the Arctic. Um, I try to encourage folks to take a look at the catalog for opportunities for collaboration, um, for opportunities to expand your analysis, and for opportunities to do some synthesis research. We all know that this data is very expensive and time consuming to collect, uh, so the more we can do with it, the better. Next slide. Um, we have a number of different disciplines represented in our repository. Um, oceanography does seem to be the most popular. Um, I think that's likely just due to um, some of the remote sensing operations, but atmosphere of which, of course, this is the subgroup is the second. Um, so we have a number of options for you all to take a look at that different data by discipline. Next slide. Uh, this is what the data discovery portal looks like. You can search by a number of different attributes. You can actually click and zoom in on the map if you're inter interested in a particular region, or you can search by person who created it, the year, um, if you know the DOI or a specific taxa that you're interested in. All of that is available to help narrow down this large amount of data set. Next slide. And we are um, running close on time, so. Okay, oh, perfect. This is, my, this is my last thing, I think. Um, we also just added a brand new feature where folks can register citations. Um, so if you know that one of your data sets in the ARC Data Center has a citation paper associated with it, please register it. Um, that way you're able to get more credit for the work that you do and hopefully increase viewership on your data sets and your papers. And I may have more slides, but that's probably the important bits. Come see my, my poster. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, George Burba. Hello, my name is George Burba. Can you hear me now? Yes, sounds good. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm, I'm a science and strategy fellow at LICO Biosciences, and I'm also fellow at International Water for Food Institute and adjunct professor in bioatmospheric sciences at the University of Nebraska. And with a large group of people, large group of co-authors, a lot uh, of them from University of New Hampshire, we were developing the large proposal for NSF mid-scale infrastructure. So it's about $50 million expansion of NEON to measure methane. And of course it covers a lot uh, in Alaska and polar regions. Next slide, please. So the uh, biggest issues are large uncertainties and inability to model and predict methane emissions globally the significant discrepancies between uh, bottom-up and top-down estimates. And both of these are complicated by continuous human activities changing the picture. So next slide, please. So we are seeking uh, input from the community, from HEU, on uh, primarily these three questions. How climate change and climate management impact sinks and sources of methane? What are our current limits? Uh, to the model methane and budget and specifically what do we need to measure why and how we've been planning it for half a year now but we really don't want to miss anything important and hence this town hall next one please so please join us and tell us what we missed if we missed anything and what you'd like to see in this expansion in this proposal uh, so these are direct measurements of methane emissions based on neon infrastructure, but not limited to neon infrastructure. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, George. Satyaki? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone, I'm Shatuki Dash. You can see my research topic on top of this slide. And on the right, you will see a beautiful picture of my lab with the LIDARs operating at Boca Flight Research Range. So the green beam is from the Rayleigh LIDAR and it we use it to know about the gravity wave activity in the 40 to 50 kilometer region. And the yellow beam is from the Doppler shift sodium lighter that helps us to know about the gravity wave activity in 85 to 95 kilometer region. That's the Mesopause region. 
Uh, so gravity waves is basically buoyancy waves in the atmosphere that transfers energy from lower to upper atmosphere. And thus studying them is very important to us because we'll be able to understand the coupling process between waves and winds in the atmosphere, especially during certain strat warming period where there is a reversal of wind. Uh, next, sli next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the polar vortex before and after certain strat warming. The color surface represents the Arctic stratospheric vortex and black surface represents anticyclones. And you can see on the left side image that the vortex is intact before SSW, but it gets split during certain strat warming that's on the right side image uh, due to the planetary waves activity. Now the vortex breakdown modifies the winds and the winds changes the circulation. Now these winds also drive the gravity waves as well. And so studying the waves will let us know about how the transportation of NOx is, uh, happens in the stratosphere from mesosphere region, which plays an important role in the ozone layer depletion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this On this slide, you can see the gravity wave uh, from the 2018-19 winter and 1920 winter. And uh, I will, would like to highlight that during the sudden strat warming period, you can see the wave activities are particularly low compared to the 1920 winter where there is no sudden strat warming. Uh, the image on the right, top right corner, you can see it is from the mirror to satellite. And you can see around first week of January, there is a wind reversal that marks the sudden strat warming period. And the picture just below that, it shows the gravity wave activity that we obtained from the sodium lighter in um, the- 85, This is your 30 second warning, thank you. Uh, in the 85 to 95 kilometer region. Uh, we, are all, we are also using uh, radar data from the poker flat meteor radar to, for the, to understand the atmospheric tides and the satellite data to understand the coupling process even more. Uh, so if you have any question, Further questions about this, uh, please attend my session at AGU on December 8th. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Zia. Hi everyone, this is Shani and I'm a PhD student from the University of Utah working with Dr. Steven Kruger, Kurt Strong and Jim Mays. So I'm glad to be here uh, for the first time to share our work about the Arctic low level clouds. So one of the main uh, motivation of this work is that, as we can see from the bottom photo, that the Arctic sea ice, which are those openings within the ice pack, once they open, they can expose the relative warm water to the cold atmosphere, enhance the exchange fluxes like heat and moisture, and then produce the boundary layer cloud plumes. So our question is, what, uh, how can these Arctic meads affect the boundary layer clouds and the associated radiative fluxes? Can you go to the next slide? So we first used uh, various observations to look at the relationship between these and low level clouds. And in short, uh, the key finding we find is that more these are also associated with less low level clouds. And this can be seen by comparing our results from two groups and the left and the right column. And one group we have fewer needs, another group we have more needs over our study domain, which is offshore of the barrier Alaska. Um, but what's interesting is that by looking at the corresponding clouds, which is the bottom one, and we find is the higher needs group actually has a more, less low level clouds. So this is actually contrary to the conventional assumption, which we believe the more needs are, are except expected to result in more low level clouds. So we also use the LES simulations to understand why it happens this way. And more details can be found in our poster, uh, which is in Dr. Minghui Diao's section. Can we go to the next slide? So next uh, we checked the non-wave radiative fluxes for two groups and our preliminary results, which are shown here, that there is a large difference in the net long wave surface flux between these two groups. And this suggests that this difference in the long wave fluxes can affect the surface cooling and also the refusing process of the open need. And yeah, I'll stop here and thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is Vaughn Walden on behalf of my co-authors. Um, we're going to be talking about mechanisms of multiple anomalous melt events at Summit Station, Greenland, 
in the summer of 2019. Next slide. Um, we know that Greenland, that the melt of the Greenland ice sheet is important for sea level rise, but it very rarely melts. Um, the surface snow very rarely melts at Summit Station, which is up at 3,200 meters above sea level. Um, ice cores from this area have shown um, only 50 such events in the last 10,000 years. However, there have been five um, melt days or days that it's melted in, in um, seven years, one in 2012 and four in 2019. So we're really interested um, in examining this 2019 event where we had um, multiple melt events, one, one in June and then three days of melt conse in consecutive days at the end of July to look at the questions of um, are subsurface snow processes important during these events? Um, basically, we've been having trouble kind of reconciling the surface energy budget measurements. So we're interested in what's going on below the surface. How well can we measure these events? What are the important parameters? And then how well can we model them? So if you go to the next slide, just a teaser of some of the measurements on the left. Um, one of the things that we were seeing is uh, during the July event, we had the surface skin temperatures go above freezing. Um, we're, sh we're seeing uh, on a couple of days where the, the skin temperature is, is at 1.5 Celsius rather than what we would expect of, of it being at the at zero C. Um, and the just to let you know that the clouds and the net radiation and the turbulent fluxes during these events were really unremarkable. And so we're really interested in what preconditioning might be occurring to set up the, the actual melt. The second middle column shows um, the model results that we've done um, using a, a, a model um, that's similar to the community fern model. And, and it does a really good job. Warning. And uh, it does a, a decent job and it's good enough to continue with some sensitivity studies, which are, are just a teaser is shown on the right here, where we have, um, we basically imposed a high density ice layer, uh, frozen layer, if you will, um, in the snowpack. And we see that these layers have the ability to increase the thermal conductivity and remove heat away from the surface. So come see my poster and I'll pull this all together. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Lefteris Anidis and I'm from Latmos in Paris. Today, I will present briefly the work I have been doing in the last couple of months it's a modeling study about investigating the origins of wintertime Arctic aerosols over northern Alaska. It's a joint work with Kerry Pratt, Patricia Quinn, and colleagues. Can I have the next slide, please? So in this study, we attempt to improve sea salt emissions and to add the marine organic of uh, uh, marine source of organics. The collaboration concerns a campaign which took place in Barrow in uh, January, February 2014, and we help us to add missing local sources and improve model aerosol composition. In this figure on the left, by Kirby's et al. briefly, we see that their samples were influenced by Open Ocea, Open Ocean Fresh SSA and Prito Bay Oil Field Organic Sulfate Aerosol. For this study, I'm using uh, the basic version of uh, WolfCam for simulations in January, February 2014 with Mosaic 8 uh, bean aerosol scheme. This version does not include uh, that don't reproduce observed sea salt organics for Barrow and other sites in Alaska. Uh, on the right, you can see the uh, three domains I'm um, using. Uh, next slide, please. So in my simulation so far, so far, I added a source of marine organics. I decreased wind speed dependence based on satellite data and added a SST correction factor to improve sea salt emissions. So as you can see from the three maps here, showing the average differences in mass concentrations for nitrate, chloride, and sodium in coarse mode between improved and cold low run for January, February 2014. The modifications led to less chloride and sodium south of Alaska and north of Atlantic, while the effect on nitrate is smaller. Uh, the figure on the right shows the mass fraction of sodium chloride and other important aerosol species as a fraction of aerosol size or barrow. We can see that the model still needs some improvements linked to fine mode for sodium chloride and organics. Now I'm working on including 
uh, local sources uh, of sesame emissions and organics as a function of CI's fraction. And this Thank is you your... for your question. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Kopek. I'm a postdoc at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, here in the AGU, I'll be presenting a series of initial results from our developing Arctic water ice soap network that has been a long time in the making. Uh, over the past several years, we've been installing a suite of water vapor isotope analyzers at a number of land-based stations around the Arctic to pair with observations on board the polar stern during the Mosaic expedition. Next slide, please. With this network, for the first time uh, at this large spatial scale, we are able to observe water vapor um, that's moving from one region to another and measure the isotopic changes uh, along the way. This really, uh, this sort of network is a dream come true for the isotopic community and will dramatically expand our ability to examine a variety of questions of the changing Arctic water cycle. Uh, here the focus of ours is examining the changing ocean ice atmosphere interactions resulting from the loss of sea ice. As the sea ice cap on the ocean surface is removed, local evaporation is uh, allowed to take place and that new moisture can be incorporated into the uh, primary storm tracks moisture pathways. Uh, next slide, please. This locally sourced moisture has a unique isotopic signal. So we're able to quantify how much moisture is, is added along these key pathways. Um, in this, in this uh, analysis, we'll be examining a, a number of different connections where we see these repeating transport patterns uh, and measure the isotopic variations from uh, between sites. So we're able to demonstrate that there is significant water vapor that evaporates and is incorporated into these air masses as they move uh, across the Arctic Basin. Uh, and we can show that the amount of moisture added is related to how much sea ice is present in a given basin, such that when there's less sea ice, more moisture is added. Uh, additionally, we can see that there are significant uh, spatial variations in just how large the sea ice influence is. Um, and so in our NGO presentation, we'll be looking at a, a number of these different site connections that we can make with our network and examine the spatial variability. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm Jonathan Hamilton from the, the University of Colorado Boulder, and I'll be talking about my poster, uh, Overcoming Technical Challenges Related to Collecting Atmospheric Data with Remotely Piloted Aircraft Systems in the High Arctic During Mosaic. Uh, next slide, please. So the University of Colorado team predominantly operated two different aircraft uh, during Mosaic. The Data Hawk 2 on legs three and four, which measures infrared temperature, pressure temperature, and relative humidity and turbulence with the fine wire array developed in-house. Uh, this aircraft weighs about 1.8 kilograms ready to fly and flies for about 45 minutes, depending on uh, the weather conditions and temperature. We also operated the Helix on leg four, which measures shortwave radiation using uh, two power anometers, one facing up and one facing down. Uh, it also measures pressure, temperature, and relative humidity. And we took some multispectral imagery using a MicaSense Red Edge MX. This way is about 12 kilograms ready to fly and flies for about 20 minutes. Uh, next slide, please. So a quick overview of the University of Colorado uh, flights. We flew as far north as about 86 degrees north with the Data Hawk, and as far south as about uh, 78 degrees north with the Helix at the end of Lake 4. So over the course of this drift and the seasons in the Arctic, we encountered many challenges uh, with extreme cold at the start of Lake 3, as you can see my our colleague Gina Joseph is very bundled up flying uh, a data hawk there in the winter uh, to different uh, very dynamic ice conditions. Uh, we have leads opening up during leg three and many melt ponds forming during leg four. Uh, during leg four, we also encountered a lot of fog, which made it challenging to operate uh, aircraft that you need to see to operate effectively. Additionally, we had to deal with drift and sometimes rotation of the flow, which is challenging when your navigation system is based off of a GPS reference frame. So I'll talk about these challenges in more depth and their solutions at my talk. So come see it on December 7th, thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Gina and my uh, poster at AGU will be on the observations of Arctic atmospheric boundary layer with small unmanned aerial vehicles for Mosaic. Um, and this will be in section AO12, which is on Monday, December 7th. And next slide. 
So as Jonathan mentioned, one of the platforms that we flew was the DataHawk 2. Um, and then the lower left uh, figure here, you can see um, the location of all of the DataHawk flights that we did um, overlaid on the Polar Stern drift track and color coded by date. So the most common flight pattern that we did was a profile from the surface up to 1,000 meters altitude or cloud base height, whichever was lower. And so we collected all of the meteorological um, data for this altitude range. Um, and our flight period was from late winter through late summer. So we have these data from that entire time period, which shows us how the atmosphere changes. Um, and as an example, in the lower right figure, you can see um, all of the temperature profiles throughout our um, flight campaign period. Um, and so you can see we sampled a variety of different boundary layer structures. Uh, next slide. Another flight uh, pattern that we did was a lead sampling flight. So we would fly um, back and forth across an open lead at low altitudes, um, and then also uh, do a small profile on either side of the lead. Um, and you can see in the lower left figure, a flight pattern um, from one of those lead sampling flights, and it's color coded by surface IR temperature. And so the warmer, IR temperatures indicate where the lead is. Um, and we're particularly interested in this type of flight because um, we want to understand how uh, the presence of lead can impact the um, atmospheric air masses on either side. Um, so we can measure the variables upwind and downwind of the lead. And by comparing them, um, we can hopefully see how the lead impacts the atmosphere and incorporate this knowledge into um, Arctic climate and weather models. And so on the lower right um, figure, you can see that I've separated a 2D map of this, of this lead sampling flight into upwind, downwind, and over the lead data points. And so in, if you come to my talk, um, I'll show how the temperature and absolute humidity profiles differ um, upwind versus downwind of the lead. And so once again, that's on December 7th, my poster. Thanks. Hello, uh, I'm Raven Kalma from the University of Colorado. And I was also part of Mosaic Lake 4 during the melting season. And this talk is going to be very complementary to uh, Jonathan and Dina's presentation. So you heard about the data hook. I'm going to speak about the Helix, the copter. So the other platform we flew uh, the Mosaic. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the, the copter um, measured the um, shortwave radiation or irradiance. And as you can see on the, the picture, depending on the surface uh, underneath the copter, the um, uh, radiation measured by the parameters are going to be very different if we're above snow or above a mountain or above open ocean. So uh, we have different flight patterns. And on the figures on the right, you can see a grid pattern. So um, the first one is from the parameter looking upwards, and the, the next one is the parameter looking downward. From these two measurements, we can calculate the albedo. And what is really interesting is when we compare the, um, the albedo measurements with the, um, the pictures, so the, the map on the bottom right is actually created from all the multiple pictures uh, taken by the multispectral camera. So we have a kind of a, a map of the flow. And we clearly see um, that the path when the albedo is um, higher corresponds to a path with like um, larger snow, snow patches. And then when the albedo is lower, it's uh, like a big melt pump um, in the middle of the, the grid. So, um, this is just an example of our measurements with the copter. We have um, more than 30 flights of grid pattern, but also when we want to uh, specifically quantify the albedo over surface. So, for example, over uh, white snow or over meltdown. And we also have a um, vertical profile to understand what is the influence of um, altitude on the albedo. Um, this, um, this measurement will be also uh, compared with other albedo measurements because during the day there are uh, different teams operating uh, parameters for short wave radiation. So and this is uh, we're 30 really second warning. We're really looking forward to um, our entire comparison because um, some measurements are uh, on fixed points on the sea ice and then um, the copter provide uh, like um, other covering space. 
So if you want to hear more about um, the pattern measurements at uh, the AGU, so that will be uh, a presentation on uh, Monday, 7th of December. Thank you. Thank you all so much. That was um, really uh, enlightening and you all did really well. I'll, I'll pass it back over to Barry. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I um, really enjoyed hearing about your presentations. Um, is there any, uh, we've only got a few minutes. Is there any questions or comments? Um, is there, is there a, a town hall that someone knows about that we should put on our calendars. I'm trying to trying to think of um, what other events that we. Oh, um, I'll try and find out the details. I I heard that NASA is going to mail out calendars to people. Um, I, I'll find out how you. Maybe there's a website or someplace where you can request a calendar to to get, receive in the mail. Um, We'll, we'll hear more about that soon, I hope. Jennifer, well, Jennifer's um, not in a good place to talk. Um, Heist, did you have anything or did you have to run to another meeting? Uh, no, I'm here. I just, I wanna thank everyone for um, showing these, these quick introductions. I think it's gonna be a fantastic AGU and there's a lot to see clearly. Um, one of the things that we had hoped to do as a uh, collaboration team is organize a viewing party and AGU, you know, is all online this year. So we were going to try to highlight a couple of Arctic atmosphere specific sessions and um, invite everybody to, to watch those together if they can uh, from the collaboration team. So keep stay tuned for, for information on that. And clearly if you're convening a session, um, please get back to us and we will make sure that, that we try to highlight those sessions. Yeah, time. if you want to vote, if you, if you if there's a particular session, I think we got all the main sessions that were Arctic related, okay. So it'll likely be one of the sessions that we, we highlighted here. Um, um, well, all right, everyone, have a wonderful um, week. We just have a few more days to get our AGU talks together. Um, I know I'm working on mine, um, still have some work to do. All right, everybody. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks everyone for your time. We'll see you soon. Uh, thanks. Great talk.